Okay, kids, I feel like I should sing the Hallelujah Chorus. Period seven. I'm going to go through this very quickly. I know you have limited time and I am fried. Well, not quite fried, but I'm getting there. So I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. Period seven we just covered in the last couple of weeks or week and a half. No. Yeah, something like that. Uh, shortly. So I'm going to go through them really quickly. Just hang with me. First, um, first term listed in the factual information is the Great Depression. Uh, historians cite several reasons for the Great Depression, uh, poor par farm sector in the decade leading up to the Great Depression, people living on credit, a disparity in income, and policies, uh, trade policies, tariff policies that prevented Europeans from purchasing American goods at a reasonable price in the aftermath of World War I. And in addition to that, you had banks and individuals that were buying stocks on the margin. And so those, those job producers, when they lost everything, when the stock market crashed in 1929, um, it had a cataclysmic domino effect into the community. So thousands of banks failed. Um, there was no security net uh, at the time. And then coupled with natural disasters, the terrible drought uh, of the decade that just dis continued to destroy the far farmers in general, 25% of the American workforce uh, found themselves unemployed in the years of the Depression. Uh, so that's the Depression in a nutshell. President Hoover happened to be at the helm just a few months after he took over off took office is when the stock market crashed and he s seemed unable to fix it. Um, the one program that he did uh, invest in was the uh, the Boulder Dam, which was later uh, renamed Hoover Dam, which produced all kinds of water for farmers out west and it provided jobs for people in the in the immediate impact uh, the bonus army from world war one marched on washington dc and uh, he congress did not pass the law and they were shooed out of town by eisenhower and macarthur and it was really bad pr and he lost re-election we probably would have lost it anyway um for uh, that's the great depression okay uh wow um progressive era and uh, the progressives, pro the three progressive era presidents are, I don't know why they have Great Depression listed first, because I would have, t I would have talked about the progressive era first, so, and imperialism, so let's start there. 1898 is the end of period six, the beginning of period seven is 1890, uh, 1890 to 1945, a little bit of overlap, so America enters a period of great Im imperialism, um, looking outside of our borders for empire building. The rest of the world was doing it. Why shouldn't we? Uh, we had purchased Alaska. Uh, William Seward, who was the Secretary of State for Andrew Johnson, um, convinced Congress to purchase Alaska, which many people called Seward's folly. Uh, glad that he did. It had ended up having a lot of oil. But that was to secure some of our northernmost borders of this continent. Uh, Russia tended to um, always kind of be a little bit of a problem. Um, let's see here. Alaska, I mean uh, Hawaii. Uh, queen Lalua Kalani was the last uh, Hawaiian queen. Uh, American business people had sugar and pineapple uh, plantations on the island of Hawaii. And by the time they were, uh, Queen Lalua Kalani was deposed, the outside number of people that lived in Hawaii that were not native born was larger than the native born population. And for years and years and years, Hawaii was able to avoid the tariffs for imported sugar uh, because of the American businesses there. But the, I think it was the McKinley tariff waived that freedom or that uh, perk and they were going to have to pay the tariffs and so that was kind of the final straw and America moved to take Hawaii as a territory uh, saying it was for their own good. They deposed the Queen using the United States Marine Force. Hawaii became a territory and then of course uh, our neighbors to the south, the Cubans, um, had been fighting for independence and they'd been fighting against the Spanish, they'd been protesting, they'd been boycotting, and the Spanish came down with an iron fist, and the, the, the conditions in Cuba got very terrible, and Americans had bleeding hearts, and sensational and yellow journalism was used uh, by Mr. Pulitzer, and I don't remember the other one, uh, showing pictures and images of people, the, the situation in Cuba, sending reporters down there. I know I think Walter Lippmann was sent down there. Uh, to report on it, and um, it really pulled on Americans' heartstrings. Um, American businesses were leaving the island uh, because of the condition, 
Relations and President McKinley at the time, who was a newly elected Republican, um, sent a uh, Navy ship down there to um, help if need be. And while they were in the, while the naval ship, the USS Maine, was in the Havana Harbor, uh, they probably had an explosion within their uh, engine area, and it. Um, created an explosion, they probably had a fire, it created an explosion, uh, but the yellow journalist said that it was a mine that was in the Havana Harbor and that the Spanish had done this, and I can't remember how many, Amer 297 maybe Americans were killed, sailors were killed, and so uh, the cry rang out, remember the Maine, remember the Maine, and President McKinley was politically twisted and tortured and went to Congress and, and asked for a declaration of war against Spain. Um, and it really initially was um, presented as a way to liberate Cuba from the oppression of the Spanish. But the attack on the Spanish Empire didn't start in Cuba. It started in the Philippines. Uh, American Navy under... <laughs> I don't remember what his name was. Doesn't matter. Anyway, the American Navy um, attacked the Spanish fleet in the Philippines. And then they uh, moved towards Cuba. And over the course of just a few months, uh, in the year 1898, uh, Spain surrendered. And as a result of that, we acquired some of their territories, the Philippines being one of those. Um, Dominican Republic, I think, was one. Guam. And then, of course, Cuba, we decided that we were going to honor our word and let them govern themselves with a little bit of interference and under under the demi or under the disguise of the teller amendment no the platt amendment i'm sorry the platt amendment gave us permission to intervene if necessary and also gave us permission to have a military base on cuba a, a, a u.s presence probably to monitor things more than anything else as you know that military base has turned into guantanamo bay cuba where we keep terrorists um who combat enemy combatants from the battlefields of the war on terror. So anyway, um, so the, the war was successful. Everybody was patriotic. We got more um, of our, our empire was spreading. We now had Hawaii. We now had some islands in the Pacific. Uh, America was kind of in, in touch and in, in step with the rest of Europe, who was also um, acting imperialistically. And of course, World War One is literally just around the corner. Um, Teddy Roosevelt comes to the attention of the world at this time. He has been serving as the Deputy Secretary of the Navy. Uh, he's from New York. He is... Um, loud and short and obnoxious and the Republicans are kind of weary of him and so they suggest that McKinley um, after his experience with the Rough Riders in Cuba uh, they suggest to McKinley hey why don't you ask Roosevelt to be your VP on your second election and he says okay and so he um, he serves as his VP and just a few months into his second term he is shot and killed and Teddy Roosevelt becomes uh, president uh, he was the youngest president uh, ever at the time, I think he was 42, something like that, and he becomes president. Uh, so he becomes the face of our first progressive presidents. Our uh, progressive presidents are uh, Teddy Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, and Woodrow Wilson. So Teddy Roosevelt rolls up his sleeves and goes to work, and he is going to insert himself into the business world, into the economy, uh, in a way that no other president has done prior to this time. And so that's when you begin to see the shift away from true hard, cold, laissez-faire, hands-off, to um, government regulation and manipulation of the economy. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt begins that. So Upton Sinclair, of course, introduces him to the idea of uh, what the what's happening in the meatpacking industry. Teddy Roosevelt investigates and begins to push legislation to clean up the meatpacking industry. Uh, he also goes after the um, inflammatory and untruthful uh, labeling of medicines and other things and food. And the Pure Food and Drug Act is passed. Uh, during his presidency, Teddy goes after the trust. And Teddy was interesting. He's like, you know, there's sometimes having a big, powerful um, industry or industry leader is a good thing if they are working on the behest or the, the good of the American people. But if they're not, then they're a bad thing. And so it wasn't necessarily that he was opposed to large, powerful companies, but he was opposed to those that took advantage of the American consumer. And so he kind of picked and chose who he went after chose who he went after. Uh, he didn't go after um, Rockefeller. Um, 
when he was president, but Howard Taft did. So, and breaking up his uh, trust and that and that sort of thing. So, but Teddy definitely goes down as tr known as the trust buster. Um, his foreign policy was interesting. He again, he was a little man with a little man with a big mouth, screamed loud, and he said, Car uh, "Speak softly, but carry a, a big stick." And so, in his case, he spoke loudly and carried a big stick. Uh, he uh, dumped money into the U.S. Navy. It was called the Great White Fleet. Uh, he persuaded Colombia to give up Panama so that we could build the Panama Canal to. To, um, uh, get our ships from the east to the west as quickly as possible or vice versa um, and when I say he anyway he persuaded them he sent our Navy down so that the Columbia could not intervene in the coup that was happening in Panama so a little turn of hand of course uh, Teddy also um, uh, introduced the world to the idea of the Roosevelt, Roosevelt Corollary, which was an addendum to the Monroe Doctrine. So not only was America telling the world stay out of our hemisphere, it also under Roosevelt was suggesting if you mess with us or you mess with the Western Hemisphere, we are acting as a police force and we will intervene in the best interest of America. So he really was, he didn't, you know, didn't um, uh, shy back from uh, confrontation. Uh, he, he, all of the progressive presidents were bad, bad, bad on civil rights. They were, they tended to be discrim raci racially discriminative types of people um, who had probably a similar attitude towards civil rights and black Americans as the average high ranking uh, elite class of America, white America at the time. So uh, not to blame them, but um, that's probably what they grew up with. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, of course, was born in the South, so he had a little bit of Southern in him. Um, so it wasn't important to them. They reformed a lot of things and they made progress on a lot of things, but civil rights for black Americans was certainly not one of the things. Uh, I'm trying to think what else with Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, at the end of his term, uh, he and H Howard Taft, or William Howard Taft had served as his Secretary of War um, and had actually um, was very good friends with uh, TR and he sort of handpicked him to be the Republican nominee for president. Taft didn't really want to be president but felt like it was his duty and so he went ahead and went through with it and was pretty miserable as president. He gained, they say he gained almost 100 pounds while he was for the, during the four years that he was president. Of course, he is the president who famously got stuck in the bathtub. Um, he does end up losing a whole lot of weight after he leaves the presidency and serves on the Supreme Court. Uh, but Teddy was unhappy with him, didn't feel like he was ferocious enough uh, towards trust and regulations, and so he decided to run against him when the Republicans would not pick Teddy Roosevelt to, uh, to be the Republican nominee the next time around. And so he ran under the, the Bull Moose Party or the Progressive Party, uh, split the ticket and led um, led to Woodrow Wilson becoming uh, elected, a Democrat being elected president because the Republican vote was split between Teddy and uh, Taft. If I remember correctly, Teddy got a lot more votes than Taft did. Uh, Taft was happy to leave office. He was miserable. And uh, Woodrow Wilson appointed him Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And that is really what he always wanted to do. And he is buried in Arlington National Cemetery in the um, area where the um, Supreme Court justices are buried. Uh, la, la, la. Taft was also known as someone who used dollar diplomacy instead of speak softly and carry a big stick. He was more about using uh, American money prestige to get things, to get his foreign policy accomplished. Uh, I think, I'm trying to think when the Boxer Rebellion happened. I don't remember. Just look at Boxer Rebellion. It happened sometime during this era. Um... I think it actually was right before World War One. Okay, so, um, and then Woodrow Wilson comes to power. So Woodrow Wilson is elected president as a Democrat. Uh, he is a academic. He was president of Princeton University. His father was a Presbyterian minister. Uh, he was the, as they say, the quintessential um, progressive and he enlarged the federal government even larger, primarily with the Federal Reserve System, um, which is still in effect today. Uh, he had a kind of a rosy outlook and felt like that he he sort of had an arrogance about him that he had the answer to world peace. Uh, in the first four years of his presidency, he continued the progressive agenda and reform and government regulations and tried to avoid war. Uh, he went after Pancho Villa in Mexico um, during the Mexican 
Civil War uh, to no avail. I think the book says he sent 20,000, maybe 10,000 troops into Mexico to track down Pancho Villa and he was never able to find him. Um, John Pershing, which was his, uh, one of his generals was sent in, was also the commander of uh, the Doughboys or the American Expeditionary Forces in World War I. Uh, so off we go. Um, World War World War One is right around the corner. It's uh, Europe has fallen into disarray. Americans are trying to stay out of the battle. Uh, they are neutral. They are isolationist. They don't want to get involved. Uh, but because the world is already at this point in 1917, 1915, 1916, they're already our markets are all intertwined. Uh, when one country is having economic downturn, other countries are having economic downturns because they're all intertwined and all connected together. And so. Um, Merchant ships are being shot out of the water by German submarines. Uh, the British and the French, who are natural allies, um, the British and the French um, are in pretty bad shape. Uh, Russia falls to the Bolsheviks, and so they withdraw from the war. Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm and his army are um, set to um, literally um, jump out of those trenches and march across France. And so things are desperate. Um, and then the final few straws, um, the Zimmerman telegram, unrestricted submarine warfare, all lead President Roosevelt in his second term to ask Congress for a declaration of war against uh, Germany and Austria-Hungary. So we join the war, we're not prepared, we don't have weapons, and we retool our massive industry to uh, fight this war. You know, women enter the workforce, you have blacks moving to the cities and the Great Migration uh, to uh, work in America's factories to help in the war effort. And um, America enters the war just about the time the war is is um, just a few short months away. We make the difference. We don't dig trenches. We send Patton over there and he marches across France uh, and pushes Germany back into Germany and the Germans surrender. That's kind of the nuts and bolts of it. Of course, there's unique things about World War I. Um, empires were collapsing and new countries would be formed out of those empires. The Ottoman Empire collapses, the Austria-Hungary Empire collapses, the German Empire collapses. Uh, even to some effect, the, the British Empire is reorganized because they, uh, they assume some of that lost territory. So Roosevelt goes over to Europe with the, the 14 points uh, for, uh, you know, worldwide peace. This is called the Great War at the time. It's not called World War I because there's only been, this is, there hasn't been a World War II. And uh, it's gonna be the war to end all wars and the 14 points are gonna get them there. But when Roosevelt, um, who is received with lots of fanfare in Europe um, as a savior of sorts, he realizes very quickly that the European allies are not interested in the 14 points. They want to punish Germany uh, for what they've done. And so at the Versailles Treaty, every last part of the 14 points is dismissed. I would strongly encourage you to know um, some of the elements of the 14 points, freedom of the seas, no secret treaties, um, taking into consideration your colonized people, um, those are the few that kind of popped into my mind. And of course, the League of Nations was the final 14th point. I think, I don't know for sure, but I would not be surprised at all, and I've said this before, that the DBQ will have something to do with the seventh uh, period seven um, because of the nature of this weirdness. So make sure you know what the, what the 14 points are. Um, but the Allies dismiss all of it. They do accept the League of Nations, and then... Um, uh, Roosevelt is there for the signing of the treaty uh, and he brings it back to the United States. I'm looking this up really quick. Treaty of Versailles, United States. Um, the United States Senate refused uh, to accept it. And I'm gonna look up the name of the Senator because it's kind of important. And it better be in here. Ah, there it is. Henry Cabot. I knew that he was, okay. So, uh, Henry Cabot was in charge of the Republican uh, caucus in the Senate. 
and he refused to allow the Versailles Treaty to be ratified. So if you know, the Constitution requires that any treaty that the U.S. enters into or the president negotiates has to be approved of by the Senate, you know, because you don't want something crazy passing. And the Senate was not comfortable with the way that the Versailles Treaty tied our hands. Uh, it made us sort of part of the um, European body of nations and restricted our, our, our ability to act um, autonomously. And so um, they just refused to ratify it. So the United States never did ratify the Versailles Treaty. In some ways that's good, in some ways, hello baby, in some ways it's bad because, my dog's down here, uh, because it prevented us from being able to intervene in Europe with the cloud of Stalin and Hitler and everything uh, rolling on in. But Henry Cabot, uh, I think that that's, for some reason I'm thinking it's Henry Cabot Lodge, let's see. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is Henry Cabot Lodge. So Henry Cabot Lodge, he was the Senate Majority Leader, so he is what Mitch McConnell is today. Uh, unfortunately for Mr. Wilson, he spent the last few months um, after he returned from Europe um, traveling the country uh, trying to encourage um, Americans to put pressure on the Senate to ratify the treaty, and he uh, cost him his health. He ended up having a stroke, and the treaty was never passed, and his uh, Wilson's wife, Edith, kind of protected him, uh, wouldn't let the, with the press or the public see the condition he was in, probably ran the show for a while, so maybe we did have a female president for a short period of time, uh, and then he quietly left office. Um, and so um, who followed him was Warren G. Harding. Warren G. Harding was a, uh, another Republican. He was a, I described him in our lesson as kind of a Bill Clinton. He only served for about a year and a half and had a, had a heart attack and died. Um, uh, his probably most significant accomplishment was the Washington Naval Conference uh, in which he invited the naval powers of the world to Washington, D.C. at the beginning of his administration and uh, convinced them to sign a reduction of ships and armament uh, to a to prevent another war. By the way, that's one of the 14 points, reduction of arm, armaments or arms. And so um, he visited Alaska and then he died. Um, the Teapot Dome scandal is associated with the Harding um, administration. Be familiar with that. I, I even remember in the television series, um, Downton Abbey, um, the, the wife of the main character uh, her brother was involved in the Teapot Dome scandal. I remember that being on the show. I'm like, I know what that is. Um, so anyway, um, and then his vice president was Calvin Coolidge, who was a, uh, I think he was from Vermont or maybe Massachusetts. Uh, he became president. Calvin Coolidge is the face of the Roaring Twenties. He was a laissez-faire capitalist and uh, so put that back into motion in the business industry. The economy boomed as the regulations were lax. Uh, labor uh, unions and such kind of declined during this era and um, he, re he vetoed a bonus army um, uh, bill. Uh, he lowered taxes. He was your classic Republican. Um, and then he left office quietly and his Secretary of Commerce, um, Herbert Hoover, became president, who was also a Republican. Uh, he was president, as I said before, we've already talked about this when the stock market crashed. We've already, I already went over that. Um, four miserable years of depression. And then Franklin Roosevelt came on the scene with the New Deal, uh, a New Deal for America uh, to fix the depression, which it absolutely never did. Helped people get by and put food on the table, but, all right, let's see here. Um, what else do they have listed in period seven that I need to cover? Women's suffrage, okay, so the, uh, pro, uh, the progressive amendments was the 16th amendment, which was the direct election uh, I'm sorry, a graduated income tax. The 17th Amendment was the direct election of senators. No longer would state legislatures choose the senators that serve them in Washington, D.C. They were directly elected by the people now. Uh, the 18th Amendment was prohibition, and the 19th Amendment was women's suffrage movement, so, or women's suffrage, and so women got the right to vote. Um, the women's suffrage movement uh, was very much part of the whole Anglo-Saxon pro-white culture and uh, did not support the civil rights movement um, as they had been abolitionists in the past. They were not arm in arm with the civil rights um, uh, of black Americans, just be aware of that. Uh, this whole era tended to be 
um, pro-native Amer pro born American, not Native American, but pro-native born. Uh, lots and lots of, actually before World War I, all kinds of laws were passed that limited um, immigration from foreign countries, um, Asian immigration, all but shut down completely. Um, can't remember which president was I just typed it on your list uh, signed the Japanese or yeah Japanese ex, no Chinese Exclusion Act the ja uh, Teddy Roosevelt signed the Japanese uh, the gentleman's agreement about ja Japanese um, immigration and then a bill was signed right before World War one uh, that put America's immigration system on a quota system uh, that so only a certain number of people could come to the, into the country. And um, those from Southern and Eastern Europe were severely restricted. Uh, so immigration almost kind of clogged up and shut down in the era up to World War I. The Great Migration technically takes place, I believe, between World War I and World War II to fill the vacuum that the lack of immigration has produced in America's factories. Um, World War II, Actually, I think the Great Migration was in the 1920s. Yeah. Uh, World War II. Know what the Great Migration is. Look that up and find out the dates. Um, I don't have it in front of me. I guess I can look it up really quick so you don't have to. Great Migration. I think it actually takes place in the, the 1920s. Uh... Okay, here it is. Uh, it occurred starting in 1916. So about the time of World War I when immigration is shut down, the great migration of black Americans into America's cities begins. So, okay. Red Scare, fear of communism, fear of socialism. That happens between World War I and World War II. That's different than the Cold War. Um, Philippine American War, be sure you're familiar with that. Uh, that took place after the Spanish American War. Uh, we decided not to give the Philippines their independence and so they rebelled against the United States. Uh, 4,000 Americans were killed in the Philippines. Um, American Expeditionary Forces is World War I, Treaty of Versailles, US Isolationism. And I just finished my lesson on World War II but I'll, t I'll just name the things that you're supposed to be familiar with. US Isolationism, which is America's attitude leading up to World War II, don't wanna get involved. Uh, Nazi Germany and Japan, Pearl Harbor, Holocaust, Japanese Americans, make sure you're familiar with uh, Executive Order 9066, uh, and the Japanese internment, island hopping, D-Day invasion, and the atomic bombs. And those are the last few things listed on period seven. And I think that I just taught that to you, so I don't need to go over that again, but be familiar with that and just kind of review it. So. Oh, I think I'm done. So, I feel like I should go out and party. Like, meaning, go get an Andy's custard with peanut butter and chocolate. That's what I'm thinking. Ah, or maybe I'll just go cook some chicken on the grill. Um, okay, so if you guys need anything, please reach out to me. I'll be around um, 1 o'clock tomorrow is the test. to Make sure you've got your e-ticket. And just... Do the best that you can. Let the chips fall where they may. If nothing else, you guys are getting prepared or you are already prepared for college level work. You've done a tremendous job. Your junior year is the hardest year and you are finishing it up tomorrow. So I'm super excited for you. I get to see your essays, which in years past, that has not been the case. And so I'm excited to see what you write. Do the best that you can and um, put your head on your pillow tomorrow night and uh, take a dip, big deep breath and hopefully coronavirus will fly away and we can have a wonderful, wonderful summer. So I look forward to seeing some of you in the halls next week. Bring me your flags, put them in my room, your state flags. I'm gonna hang them up next year. Bye.